Okay, there we go. So what I'm talking about today is video game design and uh, especially since most of you are uh, in the academic sector related to education, um, how video game design plays into education and what that means for your students and uh, sorry, what it means for your students as well as their future in uh, the game design industry if that's what they're interested in. Um, first of all, the game industry as of 2009, they, I've been trying to find more recent figures but they're still a little bit you know, uh, inaccurate, but as of 2009, the uh, game industry is pulling in $10.5 billion of revenue. And from what I had read as in 2012, they were projected to actually outsell or, uh, pulling more revenue than Hollywood and the box office ticket sales. Um, so games have become this very big industry. They're no longer a small niche category that, you know, a handful of hardcore underground gamers are into and the only people working in the industry are hardcore computer programmer nerd people. It's not like that anymore. It's a very big industry. It's a very respectable one. There's a lot of big names, people like EA, Ubisoft, Valve, um, major dollar businesses who employ thousands of people. And so there's a very big market now for people with talents in uh, graphic design as well as computer programming or uh, just game design in general, people who understand you know, the methodology of game design. And uh, another interesting statistic, these are from the ESRB, by the way, they're really respectable. They, uh, they're the ones who do all the ratings that you see on video game titles like E for everyone, T for teen, you know. Um, so they, they gather a bunch of statistics about the game industry. 67% um, of U.S. households played video games, and this was as of 2009. When I ran the numbers, um, you know, in the States, we have somewhere in the range of approximately 200 million or so houses. And uh, when you break the numbers down, it turns out to be roughly 70 to 80 million, if I remember, houses that have uh, that play video games. And that's pretty insane when you think about it. I mean, there's could be any number of people in a house, of course, but, um, you know, just considering 10 to 20 years ago, <laughs> games were pretty much a thing only in the arcades and, uh, you know, only a very few people played it. It's now become a very mainstream thing. And uh, because of that, there's a huge demand for new games and there's a big demand for consistently uh, releasing games. And so a lot of businesses like EA and Ubisoft and some of the ones I've mentioned have um, really gotten this thing down to, you know, an assembly line practically. And they're hashing out new games all the time and they're making a lot of money off of it. So if you have students who are interested in game design, it's definitely, it's, it's not, you know, it's not a thing you laugh off anymore. You say, well, hey, there's a lot of money there and there's uh, a lot you can learn. So um those are kind of the first things I want to talk about in the industry. Number of American jobs that were projected by 2009 uh, was over a quarter of a million. And I'd read that in 2012, they projected some, um, I believe, like 1.5 million uh, jobs, at least in the states that are related to game design. Uh, so obviously those jobs are opening up. And I can only imagine as time goes on, technology gets better and hardware gets better that there's only going to be more and more jobs. And uh, that's not even to go into the fact that knowing game design couples, you know, that goes hand in hand with knowing computer programming and even down to certain electrical engineering concepts and things that could be uh, applied into multiple industries, not just entertainment software. Which kind of brings me to my next point. I want to talk about gamification. Gamification is... Um, how do I put it? It's applying, it's the applying the application of game design methodology to areas outside of entertainment software. So basically areas outside of video games. Um, one example of this uh, I could think of is what I have up on my screen is called Foldit. And uh, I was actually going to pull up the program. Foldit is a University of Washington experiment. It was done in tangent with their, I believe is their biochemistry division and uh, their computer science division. And what Folded is, let me hop in here. It is a protein, uh, ana I don't know if I'd say analysis. It, it, it's basically an engine that simulates 
the structure of proteins and the atoms that make up a protein. And it's based on real world uh, physics, it's based on real world biology and chemistry. And every protein in nature basically looks to have, uh, you know, they fold into a certain uh, a way and, and that's what creates a certain protein. And what this program does is it tries to encourage people to bend proteins as efficiently as possible to maximize their score. And what this has actually ended up doing, there's some 500,000 people or so that utilize this, and uh, University of Washington actually, um, you know, they crowdsource this out. I was able to download it. I, I don't even go to University of Washington, but they actually use the results they get out of this game to, uh, they use it in studies and research on protein analysis and amino acids and things like that. Um, so it does like this is the introductory level what it's just telling you how to use it the side chains of your you know I can move these around and what it does is it basically gives me 5500 points for finding the most efficient configuration for this protein and uh, if you just keep going on it kind of gives you more and more it gets a little bit more complicated and uh, it's the same concept you're trying to get rid of these clashes which means you have to get these farther away from each other. And then later you end up connecting like hydrogen strains and stuff like that. And you keep getting points for it. Um, you see my points across the top. Anyway, you get the basic idea. Now this isn't like a game you would traditionally think of, you know, like a first person shooter or a, a Mario style platformer. It's not just for fun. Uh, this actually has, it, it, it is a puzzle kind of game because you have to use your brain and everything and you think about it and you have to solve the most efficient way to do it. But ultimately, this is a fine example of gamification. It, it was a group of researchers who basically wanted to use game design methodology to encourage people who are otherwise not biologists or chemists to actually participate and help contribute to scientific research. And on top of the fact that there's plenty of people who would love to do that, like myself, and I'm not a chemist major or anything, um, it's just a great way to just reach everybody and be able to crowdsource this kind of research. And um, this program was in the spotlight probably two years ago, I think, uh, because a handful of people were working on uh, protein synthesis and they actually found out the perfect structure of a certain strain of HIV protein that uh, that chemists and biologists had not been able to uh, to image for like over 20 to 30 years. And within a year or two, when they put the challenge out, uh, the people who played the game were able to actually figure it out and they conducted it in labs. They, they cross-checked it and everything checked out. So there was an actual pretty big leap of understanding certain parts of the HIV virus that came from people using this program as a game. Uh, so that's an example of just how gamification is starting to affect other industries because this could be related to pharmaceuticals uh, for drug companies to manufacture, you know, something to help slow down the, the you know, the, the spreading of HIV and things like that. Um, other examples I can think of was Green Giant, the vegetable manufacturer. They did a <laughs> they did a campaign a while back where if you bought a Green Giant can of vegetables, you would get like free Farmville points. And that's, that's like really loose gamification because it's not necessarily that they made a game or anything like that, but it's kind of applying that same idea that people buy something and they get rewarded with, uh, with something they use in a game. And they noticed that when they did that, they actually had a, a major increase of sales during the time period that they did that. And um, it was very effective. And people who didn't know who Green Giant were before that, it raised their brand awareness uh, by like 15, 20% or something along those lines. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but that's another example. Um, you know, gamification, you could really take that concept really far, even down to business management if you wanted. You know, uh, <laughs> I won't go into that too far, but hopefully you get the idea. Um, what I'm, the, the overall, to sum this whole thing up with gamification is that games or game design methodology and the skill sets that go into game design are no longer just being used to create hack and slash, you know, adventure games and shooters and just stuff that, you know, you just enjoy as entertainment. They're now being used in a more serious manner in many other industries. And um, that's why I believe that in the coming years, you're going to have a huge amount of jobs open up uh, with people looking for people with game design talents. So, um, 
game design, game design, game design. I've been talking about that here for some 15 minutes or so. Um, but what do you, how do you implement game design in your classroom, for instance? So you're at a school, maybe a high school or a college, and, and you want to implement, well, more likely a high school, but um, you want some sort of game design curriculum to prepare your students for the real world. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. In the recent years, the last four or five years, uh, we've started seeing extremely low-cost uh, video game engines start popping up. And uh, the one I'm focusing on today is called Unity 3D, which is right here on my screen. I just brought it up. Um, you can see it's pretty familiar to uh, like Maya or Max as a viewport. Um, over here, you have a hierarchy of items that are in your scene. Uh, you have all your assets listed down here. And then every item within uh, Unity that you can click on shows its properties on the right. Um, that's how Unity looks. I want to kind of give you an idea of some of the games people make in Unity. Uh, a lot of them are for cell phones, uh, iOS and Android, um, and some of them are pretty big. You know, uh, Cubeman 2 is a pretty big one. Um, you know, these are just a couple of games. Temple Run 2. Temple Run was a really big game on on the uh, the App Store, if I recall. Uh, but there's, you know, these are just some of their featured ones. There's a ton of games people have been making with Unity. Um, and it's a very powerful engine and it, it blew my mind because I came from kind of a programming background when I was in high school I was really interested in game design. That's what got me into programming and back then they didn't have these kinds of engines that were so uh, Inclusive and had so many features and back then I was trying to make games By programming the whole engine myself because it's like the only ones that were out there at that time Were the really expensive ones that basically only the big studios got and so me as a student, I was never gonna be able to mess with that. So I would always mess around trying to make my own engines and I would just get frustrated and it's very difficult. And then when I first used Unity, I was just, I, I just said, this is ridiculous. Like I, I don't even have to bother with an engine. I just worry about the functionality. And, um, it, it's, and it's so easy to understand. Um, I'm using Unity 4.0, which is their, well, 4.1 technically, uh, which is their newest one. And, uh, oh, I kind of skipped something about gamification one second, but this kind of goes into unity too. Uh, I know some of you, uh, have architecture curriculum as well. Uh, one way we're seeing unity used in other, uh, industries is in architecture. Well, this isn't necessarily gamification. This is more about unity. So I'm still on track. Um, we see a lot of architects now are starting to use Unity to basically do this with their designs. Um, I'm actually controlling where I'm walking and looking. I'm actually able to go in here, the door's open for me. And I can look at this wall, I can hit E and change the materials. Uh, the way this was done, this isn't mine, this is from a uh, different website. Um, uh, somebody did this model in Revit. Autodesk Revit architecture, and then they would bring it into Unity and they would script um, certain things like the fact that these doors open when I step near them, or the fact that if I press E at this wall, it changes the material. Um, these are things that you can script into Unity. This brings a whole new level of, I mean, just freedom to architects in general because they're able to create. Uh, I mean, they don't even have to create a walkthrough in Revit anymore because all you have to do is pop it into Unity and put down a first person controller and you'll allow people to be able to walk around however they want. And you can do things like, well, you wanna see, you know, different materials on your walls, let's, you know, let's try this wood here and see how that, see how that goes. Or, um, you know, you can animate, you can add like physics to any water objects and things like that, just so things look nice. You can add, um, he didn't do a skybox, but I think the other one I have did. I have another one here. This guy did a pretty proper one, but he did it. Um, this is the Tota group. They did it more in a, uh, a third person view. So they have a character here and you get to walk around. You can check out their house and um, I can click on exterior up here and I can change the house's materials and say, well, uh, I kind of like that brick. And now I'll close that exterior, my door, oh, it's not opening for me. 
There we go. Um, I was a little bit bug in there programming. When I go in the house, it gives me exterior options. When I go out, it gives me interior options. So I can mess with, uh, say, um, the kitchen tops, uh, maybe the sofa. I'll make the sofa really bright green, I guess, and the pillow will look like a piece of bricks. And so now if I look at my house, you can see these changes that the sofa's green, the tabletop's green. Um, I don't know where my pillow was, my brick pillow. But I can go up the stairs and um, see the master bedroom and kind of get an idea of what's going on. There's the pillows. Yeah, brick pillows. Um, and if I walk outside, another thing you can see, I believe they did a skybox. Um, yeah, if you see the sky, there's like clouds and everything. That's another thing you can do in Unity. Um, but this is a way that we're starting to see architects utilize Unity, which is a game engine, to actually animate their... Uh, their designs. So this is a fun way, especially if you have a uh, curriculum for architecture students and like graphics students and game design students, you could in theory do a three-way joint project between the three. I know it's usually hard to coordinate stuff like that, but in theory you could do that. Uh, and it would be a great experience and something for everybody involved to be able to put on their portfolio or to show off, you know. Um, this one I was pretty impressed with. I haven't found an architecture walk through done this well yet there's some bugs about it but overall i thought it was um pretty good so <clears throat> that's just another way that we're seeing unity used um and that is running on unity's web player which in unity you have the ability to export to the uh, web player right out of the software um so anyway let me show off unity a little bit here so unity is a 3d game engine uh people have asked me if it can do 2d and from what I've read, I haven't actually done 2D in it. What I've read is that they have a separate set of like APIs and uh, plugins that you can get for Unity that will allow you to do 2D. But in general, I recommend people, if, if they want to do 2D, look at something like Game Salad, which will probably be a lot better and easier to use for a 2D game. If you want to do 3D though, Unity is the way to go. Um, is really cool. So I have a giant terrain here and I actually made this in Unity. I've had people ask me before if you can design levels in Unity. Yes, you can. Um, this is a terrain map. Uh, you can create a terrain within Unity using the create terrain option and you can use the terrain toolkit to get it the way uh, you want. Terrain toolkits here. Um, I won't go too far into that because I've already got terrain made out and on on the scale in unity this thing is absolutely gigantic like if i look at uh my box i mean that's way small on that map so i got a bit of a scale issue but that's probably my own problem uh, i also have a sky box in this scene whereas normally it's just got a blue background so you can do sky boxes if you ha if you make your own um what do you call it uh textures and things like that um then you could technically bring them into Unity and use them however you want. If you have your own kind of skybox, you could bring that in and use that. Uh, so Unity works with what they call game objects. And what that means is, uh, well, essentially, if I go up here and go game object and hit create empty, it shows my X, Y, Z. And if I hit F to focus on it, I mean, there's nothing there. It's just space in 3D space. Sorry, it's a, it's a dot in 3D space. Um, a game object is exactly what I just said, basically just a point in 3D space. You can see <clears throat> what it does though is it adapts uh, components, or sorry, Unity has components and you put components onto empty game objects to give them uh, a look, a script, a function, whatever. Um, so we can see our uh, inspector over here on the right side of my screen, there's just a transform right now specifying the location XYZ space of my viewport. Um, but what you can do with empty game objects is I can go up to a component and add maybe a uh, mesh filter and let's say mesh render. And with the mesh filter, uh, oh, I've got all my Revit stuff in here. Do, 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 do. <clears throat> I'll do like the Scott's Pine. So it's pink, and then on the mesh render, I'll just do a, um, I'll just do like a white color. Yeah, it looks ridiculous, but 
I'm just trying to illustrate the idea. So with an empty game object, I was able to uh, give it a jaggedy, meshy look. That's supposed to be like a tree, but because of the lighting and everything, it kind of looks strange. But that all came from an empty point in 3D space. Now, I'm gonna delete that. If I look at some of my items that I have down here, if I throw in a first person controller, so let me find my cube real quick. If I drop a first person controller in here, uh, which is basically a game object, if we look over here on the right side, that has a couple of scripts attached to it, like a mouse look script, a character motor script, FPS input controller, and I added my own projectile script to it. And what this allows me to do, uh, let me, I need to move my join me menu. It is in my way can't move it. Okay, if I hit play, uh, I can see my game in action now. And I can move around. And so my join me menu is like right on top of my play button. And I can't move it. Anyway, um, so all these scripts are attached to my game object here, which allows me to use WSAD or spacebar to jump uh, and WSAD move me around. And my projectile script is, uh... oh, okay, I know what I need to do. Where's my projectile script? There we go. My projectile script allows me to specify a spawn point for a fireball to come out of when I left click. So it kind of just shoots out of the middle of my guy. And uh, I have this box here, which has a <coughs> rigid body collider attached to it, which allows me when I hit it, it allows it to actually fumble around with, with the force of what my uh, fireball is hitting it at. And uh, whenever my fireball hits the ground, it explodes. And these are all things I had to script myself, but um, in Unity with the scripts, when we're talking about scripts, where, here we go. Uh, I can open up my projectile script from within Unity and it will open up uh, Unity's MonoDevelop editor. MonoDevelop is Unity's uh, code editor. And I believe you can use whatever code editor you want, but uh, if you don't have a code editor, Mod develops pretty cool. Um, Unity utilizes, it can run C Sharp, JavaScript, or Boo programming. Uh, in my project here, I utilize the JavaScript, and uh, I tend to find it's kind of the easiest way to do it. Now, I know C Sharp is probably a lot more powerful in some regards, but um, just for simplicity, I was going with the JavaScript, and I'm a bit more familiar with Java. Uh, but the JavaScript I'm going to add on to this is, or sorry, the JavaScript in Unity is very far removed from JavaScript outside of syntax, like, you know, pointing variables and uh, functions and, you know, the normal if statements and everything. Outside of the syntax, uh, Unity provides its own API with its own set of functions and uh, items such as this rigid body. <clears throat> item here like if you were to type that in normal JavaScript like it, it would have no idea what you're talking about But in unity they actually have that built in as a function and their compiler understands that So it's actually very very intuitive and very easy to grab onto when I first approached unity script I, I was sort of apprehensive because because just because there's a lot of things you don't know what they're doing because you don't know what a rigid body is until you kind of dig deeper um, but if you're on Unity's website, they actually have their entire API uh, listed here, every single function, every single thing, and it's amazing because they, they show you every single way you can use it. They even show you um, examples of how to use certain things. You know, they'll give you an example of common operations, they show you what's going on. I mean, I <laughs> I didn't know any of the Unity functions when I started using this, and I literally learned everything about it just by reading their scripting uh, webpage here. So their API is very extensive, and it's very easy to access, and it's practically built into the 
into the thing because if you're in mono develop and you just go to help you go unity api reference it brings you right to it and uh then you can check out what the use gravity function does okay it's a boolean tells you it's a boolean then it even shows you how you could use it uh, you know, disable gravity on all rigid bodies entering this collider, and they give you an example of what that code would look like. So, f I know uh, a lot of students are very intimidated by programming uh, and kind of math concepts in general, um, but Unity approaches it in a way that you don't have to worry about the really fine details of the programming. You're only really scripting within an engine, and so it's more like you're given a set of instructions and it's kind of just filling in the blanks to a certain extent. You still have to apply the logic and you, you will still have to think through a problem. Um, but you know, that's what's so good about programming is it gets you thinking in, in that way. It gives you thinking in a logical programming way and it's a very valuable skill to have. Um, and what's fun about Unity is a lot of kids are drawn to video games. I know that's why I wanted to get into programming. And when I was in my programming class, 95% of everybody in that class was taking it because they wanted to make games. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't even a gaming class. It was a computer science class. But everybody who was in it was like, I want to make games. Um, so just because of that, it's very easy to get people uh, engaged in programming because if they see that it's going to go towards their game if they see that they change one line of code and it makes their character shoot a fireball out that's a really cool and rewarding feeling and that gets kids really interested in learning the ins and outs of programming um and i, I mean i wish i had unity when when i was in school because this is just awesome i, I probably would have actually made a game with it um and it would have helped me with programming immensely because I had to just read through books to figure out how to program. And uh, I mean, yeah, I was hands on too, but it's not as visual as this and it's not as comprehensive. I mean, it's much more fun when you have something to look at that actually looks decent and you're able to uh, communi you know, able to work around in it. Um, so the programming in Unity is excellent. It's very streamlined and it's very easy for people to pick up and learn. They'll still need guidance, especially if they don't know how to program up front, but I think this is an excellent way to teach the fundamental concepts of programming, and especially how programming works with game design, um, if that's what they're wanting to go into. Because in my mind, if you're gonna go into the game design industry, you have to know some level of programming. It doesn't matter if you're the director, you know, it doesn't matter if you're the graphics artist, you're gonna need to know some programming. And in the future, anyway, it's like, everybody should know programming to some extent um, at least a little bit because it's a very valuable skill and the more and more digitized our world gets and the better hardware gets the more valuable it will be to know how to program a computer uh, or write your own programs so that's one of the main things about unity that i really like uh, now what i'll talk about is kind of the interoperability of unity and what i mean by that is its ability to work with other software especially 3d modeling software um, what I have, I'll show off the architecture side first. This is Revit. This is the program I was talking about that people are using to do those walkthroughs that I was showing you. Uh, this is the basic project that comes with Revit. Some of you who have used the program probably noticed this one or recognize it. Uh, what I want to do is ultimately bring this into Unity and uh, this is extremely easy. If I have my model, I put it in a 3D view and I say, okay, that looks cool. Uh, I click on my Revit button at the top, I go to export, and I choose FBX, and this will save the file as a, uh, where are my old Unity projects, there we go. This will save the file as a 3D file that can pretty much be read by any other 3D program. I think FBX is one of the main standards that um, all, the, all the different software uses. Uh, snow level assets, there we go. And so I can call this Revit building, I'll just call it two. I'm gonna save this right into my Unity Assets folder. And what this is gonna do is create the FBX and the FBM file inside of my Unity directory. And then uh, when I open up Unity now, it might take a second to load. 
now I have my Revit building two uh, here in my asset. I've already, you can see a couple other ones from just me testing stuff out. Um, so now my Revit building two is in Unity right off the bat. And uh, what I can do over here is select certain properties that I want it to do or to adopt when I bring it into my scene. And I can tell it to generate colliders, which will mean that it will allow a collision to happen on basically any walls or anything, any objects that you see on the Revit model, you're going to see, um, well, I'll show you in a second here. Um, you can do light map UVs and stuff like that. Uh, you know, usually it's recommended to do a lot of that stuff in a 3D modeling program like Maya or Max, but if you're on a strict budget and you don't have Maya Max, you can do this kind of stuff in Unity. Uh, it's just you won't have as many tools at your disposal to, uh, you know, do like animations and things like that. Um, now it imports the materials, but the thing with the Revit models, uh, let me change my scale factor here to uh, 0.05 or something because it's really small and it's still very small. I'll just do, I'll do scale factor of one, which might be ridiculously large. Let me see. I've got a ton of programs around my computer's kind of choppy right now. I apologize. Okay, that's a bit better. It's still pretty big, but I can drop that into my seam. I'll scale it down a little bit. And you see how up front it's gray, it comes in gray, and the materials aren't applied directly off the bat. Now, the materials are brought into Unity, but because Unity, um, the material libraries that Autodesk switched to with like the 20. 12 release, I believe, are not natively integrated into Unity when you pull it in. So there's a little bit of extra work that would have to be done if you're going to bring this straight into Unity, but it's not very hard. You would just find the items you want, like this roof, and you would go over here under the, sh the shader, and you would uh, specify what kind of color you want, and you can see it change. So that roof material is basically attached to all my other materials. Um, but anyway, you would go through a kind of a tedious process and do that. Or you could have this brought into 3ds Max or Maya first and have somebody do all the textures and make it look nice. And that will properly export out into Unity uh, with all the materials and everything proper. It's just going from Revit straight into Unity. There's kind of a disconnect, but you can get it to work. Pro um, you can get it back up to back up to par. Basically, it just takes a little bit of extra time. Um, but now my building's in here. I have generated colliders on it. Now what I want to do is take my first person controller, which I used to move around in my seam, and I'll just position him in such a way that he starts off uh, on this house and he'll be able to walk on it. Let me play my game. <clears throat> so my character, see, what Generate Colliders does is it allows my character to actually walk on this terrain. If I didn't have the colliders on, I would have fallen right through it. And uh, that's one thing Unity handles like beautifully is collision. Um, I used to just pull my hair out trying to program collision data from code. And when I played, when I <laughs> opened up Unity and there was a button for generating colliders, it just blew my mind. So. Um, I think that's awesome, but I can't get into my house. Um, so what I could do, you know, ideally what you would want to do is take, say this door and add like a script to it so that if the player approaches a certain distance, you know, plus minus X, Y, Z location from the door, it would open. Um, but what I'm going to do for simplicity's sake here is just delete it and <laughs> I'll, uh, get my character back in here. And now I can jump into my house and kind of check things out. So I got my living room and uh, there's more doors down here. I could kill all these doors too and go through and check out the rest of the house. But I'm just giving a basic idea. Here's my bar. And you can kind of see my scale factor is ridiculous. I can't even see over the bar, but uh, yeah, I can go up my stairs and uh, so on and so forth. And if I you know, maybe I want to be able to go out this door too. I'll delete that door. Now I'll hop back up my uh, stairs real quick. And you know, ideally you would 
be able to make your model look uh, really good with all the different textures and all the different windows and doors and everything like that. Um, so I've come out on my balcony and I can look at my nice sunset on my sky map and etc. So that is the basic uh, workflow of bringing in you know, a Revit model into Unity. Really, it's a one-step process. After you have the model, you just export it as an FBX and you just pop it right into Unity and you can use it. Um, you can also do this with uh, Maya models. Let me open up. Uh, those of you who use Maya probably know what this is. This is one of their default like tutorial file guys. I'm horribly bad at like anything that deals with drawing or, you know, visuals like this. So I'm going to spare you my, my bad skills and just use something that uh, Autodesk already made. Um, so there's a 3D model here and it's got a skeleton and everything like that. Uh, I don't have any animations on it right now. Uh, ideally, if you wanted animations in your game, you would bake them in the 3D software and you could actually manipulate them within Unity, but I won't really go into that. Um, but this is pretty much the same thing. I can go up here, I can export, um, uh, export all, and I can do an FBX. Uh, or was it under D, I think? Yeah, Unity 3.5 projects. Uh, I can export this into my assets folder again. Um, I'll call this one human body two. I can tell it what to export and I'm going to tell it to do an FBX. I'll go export all. It's going to give me a problem. <clears throat> now when I go back into Unity, I have my human body two .fbx file. I can drag that in here and apparently it is extremely small. There we go, scale that guy up. Okay, and I have my full model in here. And you see what I was saying that Maya models will actually retain the materials? Um, that's what I'm talking about. 3ds Max and Maya will uh, keep your materials. That's why he has the skin color. Um, you notice that his back is bright, but his front's not. Uh, Unity has lighting within it. I have a uh, light source, I believe, coming from my son. Or, yeah, I have a directional light, which is in the direction my sun is at, and that's basically like sunlight, and that's shining down on my um, on my uh, terrain, and that's generating all that light that we see. Um, you can do um, you can add game objects by default. They have certain particle systems, 3D text, and different lighting that you can use. So that's how you do that, but. Um, of course, if you're using 3D software like Max Maya, you'd probably make a level within those and do all your lighting and everything in there. But um, again, like I was saying earlier, if you're on a budget and you don't have those programs, then Unity can handle most of your needs. Um, so let me go back to my human body. Uh, so up front, I just have the body in here. And if I look at human body 2, uh, it's got all the same options. I could give it colliders and everything. If I actually... Um, let me see here, if I play my game, I think I'll, we'll see that fall through the earth. Oh no, it actually stood. Oh, it doesn't have any physics applied to it, so it's just standing there, and, okay. Well, it doesn't have colliders, so technically I would just be able to pass right through this if I walked on it. Um, but again, that was just the functionality of exporting straight from FBX right into Unity. And it's very simple, and I could start messing with this. I could start adding scripts over here under the components if I wanted to. Uh, I could add camera controllers. With a little bit of work, I could actually turn it in to a moving rig, which I took the liberty of doing earlier with uh, this asset, where I actually have the camera coming out of the head here, and I've attached motor scripts and projectile scripts to this, uh, what they call prefab. Prefab is basically an asset that has a ton of stuff on it that you've done, you know, so I'm, I'm able to just drop it in here. So now if I were to play, my main source is going to be coming from... Oh no, I fell through the earth. Why'd I fall through the earth? Okay, I was too low. I was already like through the earth. Anyway, so now I'm actually first person controlling that actual Maya model. And I have my projectile set so I can shoot it. And I'm apparently way taller than everything else on the map. I'll just shoot my box to death. And I think when I 
get my box to low enough health it explodes or something. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so you're able, with a little bit of work, you know, you could bring a model straight in and you could turn this into your main character if you wanted. Um, other software you can bring stuff in from, uh, one example is 3ds Max. So this is one of their sample buildings. Uh, some of you may have been familiar with this where they had you kind of corkscrew the top of it. Um, you know, if I were to play my game, you know, I got the building right next to me. It has colliders on it. Well, sorry, it doesn't have colliders on it because I just walked right through that thing. I forgot to add colliders, but <clears throat> that was a building that was done in Max and uh, exported as an FBX file pretty much straight into Unity, same thing. Uh, even down to Autodesk Inventor, um, and this is a bit different here. This little Arbor Press machine was done in, Arbor, in, in Autodesk Inventor. I export as an FBX, so you could bring it right in here. And um, if I wanted, you know, you can grab each item and you could script these. So I could say, I want this guy to do a script where every two seconds it moves its Y value or its Z value up and down, you know, by negative one or two. Uh, you can start doing stuff like that and use things like this in your scene as well. I haven't actually seen Inventor really used in a Unity setting, but I know it could be done. I just think um, since it's a mechanical engineering software, you kind of have to be creative with what you do in Unity with it. Um, but that is a possibility. Uh, really, any 3D modeling software that can do FBX or uh, other common file formats you should be able to bring right into Unity and whether you're using Rhino or Blender or Mudbox or whatever you should be able to bring that stuff into Unity and utilize it. Um, last thing I want to talk about because I've kind of shown off the basic features of Unity here and sort of the general idea um, and I want to get to the Q&A since I'm running a bit behind. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is the STEM education thing because I remember having a guy and one of the first times I did this webinar he was saying that his administrators won't give him funding for game design because uh, game because the administrators have this view that game design is not STEM that they want to spend the funding on on STEM stuff because that's what you're getting the money for and that's what the government's trying to tell everybody to go for so administrators and all these people want to spend the money on STEM, but I can't think of anything that's like a better investment for STEM than game design because it has every single aspect of STEM involved. Um, the science is there, computer science, the programming end of it, that's all science. Um, and beyond that, when you start dealing with 3D games like this, you have physics and things like that. This encourages people who make games to understand the laws of physics and understand many of the equations that make up physics. Um, because you want to be able to get the physics in your game to be realistic. Um, so to say that, you know, so science is definitely a part of it. Technology, that's a no-brainer. You're using computers all day. You're programming computers. You're using 3D modeling software. Uh, I mean, it, it's so hands-on with technology, it's ridiculous. Um, science, technology, engineering. Next one's engineering. That's the hardest one for me to, to argue here, but really some of the concepts in game design, especially the math you have to do, like I was saying with physics and stuff like that, teaches you a lot about engineering, um, especially down to buildings. I mean, if you want to make a game where when a, a bomb or something hits a building in a certain spot and you want to tell that building to crumble in that spot and actually do a stress analysis on the building to see if it would collapse, which is very complicated, but you could in theory do that, you would have to understand a certain extent of engineering to be able to make something like that happen. Um, and then mathematics. I don't even need to go there. Computer programming is extremely involved with mathematics. If you know how to program, you basically know your math very well, especially if you know how to do game programming and physics programming, you're going to know the math. Uh, and some have even added the art end of it on there. So STEAM instead of STEM education. And I would agree with that because, um, I'm a believer that video games can be art, and so, especially when you're dealing with graphics and 3D modeling people, I mean, some of the stuff these people make is amazing. I mean, you just have to watch a Pixar film to realize, like, computer graphics can be art for sure. And so, when you add that element into it, and the fact that you have storylines and everything integrated into games now, you could even say games occupy science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. 
So to me, it's the big shebang. It's got everything. And for anybody to say that, you know, you're not going to fund game design because it's not STEM related, I would just argue back at them, especially if you really want a game design curriculum. Just tell them, hey, that's ridiculous. And here's why. Mark Phillip told me so. No, but um, but really, I mean, it, it, to me, that's a very valid argument. And um, I think it's a great skill set. It's a great, you know, methodology to know for the future of technology and the future of the game industry and many other industries who are starting to adopt games uh, into their business, even if they're not making video games. So um, I think with that, I'll leave you guys with a Q&A here. Um, I'm going to keep it muted so I don't get feedback, but if you want to ask me questions, um, what you can do is use the chat menu on the, the second item from the left on the join me menu. Uh, open up the chat menu and you can just ask me questions and I'll get them and uh, try and answer them. But I'm having some Windows issues real quick. Let me stop.